Next, we discuss international organizations and global governance. In order to do so, we first have to define what international organizations are. It's best doing this by distinguishing organizations from institutions first. So, as an institution, we refer to any set of formal or informal rules guiding or constraining the actions of the involved parties. In society, we have a great number of actors and all of these could potentially act in very different kind of ways. And in order for society to work, it's best if there are some kind of principles or rules or constraints to the ways that actors might act because otherwise society just wouldn't work out. For example, if we encounter a person and we have to have some kind of interaction with that person, there are typically codes of how we greet one another. In Germany, for example, there used to be the custom that um, at least in some um, settings we would shake the hands of the person that we encounter. And this barbaric tradition, of course, is um, currently not in place because we should all um, not touch one another in the pandemic. And it's uncertain whether this barbaric tradition will resume after the pandemic or whether it will slowly disappear and fade away and we'll um, find um, some other kind of convention. But any kind of convention that we have there could already be called an institution because it's an informal set of rules that constrain our um, actions because it means that we wouldn't, I don't know, in Germany kiss the person that we meet, which one might do in France, for example, but in Germany this wouldn't seem um, appropriate in settings where it would seem appropriate in France. So this is already an um, institution. And then there could be also be formal institutions, like let's, for example, say marriage is an institution in probably all countries um, in the world and it um, regulates how uh, two human beings that become a couple are expected to behave to one another and um, to others. So marriage is an institution and it is a formal institution. If we think of international institutions, we might for example think of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires states that have nuclear weapons not to help any others develop nuclear weapons and requires states who don't have nuclear weapons not to try to obtain nuclear weapons. So in theory all different kind of states could do all different kind of stuff but under the non-proliferation treaty the states know exactly what they are required to do and they all agreed um, to do so. So this is a formal set of rules constraining um, the actions of the involved parties. The involved parties being all those who are signatories to the treaty. An organization is a certain type of institution, but not all institutions are organizations. So as organizations, we only refer to those institutions that have a legal personality of their own and can act um, as agents. So for example, handshakes, they don't have a legal personality. This is just something we do and we know that we might be supposed to do it. Marriage per se also doesn't have uh, a legal personality. It changes something in, in the personality status of the involved parties, but it doesn't have one itself. And marriage by itself cannot act. A couple maybe can act, but marriage itself cannot act and handshake cannot act. However, organizations um, can act. And also in the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, it cannot act, it cannot do something. It's just a treaty that's um, there written. And you cannot write an email to the non-proliferation treaty because they don't have an address, they don't have an email address. And if you were to write a letter to the non-proliferation treaty, it wouldn't be able to answer you because there is no one there who would be responsible for writing that letter. In an organization, however, there you could actually write a letter or write an email and you would just have to search and find the address. And an organization that relates to the non-proliferation treaty is the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this is um, an international organization that, among other things, has the task of overseeing the uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty and checking whether states are complying with the norms of this institution. 
So all organizations are also institutions, but not all institutions are also organizations. As a general rule of the thumb, you can say, if it does have an address and it does have a website, then it's probably an organization and not only an institution. And you would call this an international organization or institution if it is created by a mutual agreement between national governments. And examples for this are both of the above. So the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as well as the International Atomic Energy Agency, are both um, created by international treaties um, agreed to by um, different national governments. This is what international organizations and institutions are. Global governance is a term for a certain way to look at what these institutions and organizations do. And the idea here is exactly what I said before. The idea is that we now live in a globalized world with a globalized economy and the political reaction to this cannot effectively be performed by individual um, national states because national actors cannot very well um, react to international and global developments. So the idea is there has to be some other kind of political reaction. However, everybody else knows there is no such thing as a world state or world government, so it can't be that. And one way to look at this problem is saying what we need and what we to some degree also have is global governance. And then we first have to distinguish governance from government. Government is an institution or a group of people governing an organized community. Typically, this is bound to national sovereignty, at least today it is. Of course, in federal republics, we also have governments on the subnational state level, and typically we also have governments on the municipal level. However, these subnational governments are never sovereign, and they are always in some way bound to um, the sovereign national governments. And in governments, we expect that we have clear hierarchies and rules for decision making in what we would consider typically the best case, um, they are fixed in the constitution. The notion of governance, however, is more vague. So there we say there's also governing that happens. However, it happens by, with and without governments, which means there are also other actors involved in the process of governing which particularly refers to, in the case of global governance, um, NGOs, so, so global non-governmental organization, um, let's say like Amnesty International or Greenpeace. Um, it also involves businesses, particularly transnational corporations, that are somehow um, involved in the process of creating those um, global norms. And the concept of governing also is typically referring to a multi-level perspective on governance, on governing, means there are municipal levels, there's maybe a state level, so subnational level, national level, a regional level, and also a global level. And governance is then supposed to be distributed across these levels um, to a certain extent. So national states keep most of their sovereignty but they give up some sovereignty to higher levels in order to come to terms uh, with globalization. And governance is not supposed to be focused on clear hierarchies and rules, but it always involves some kind of negotiations uh, between the actors, of course, in order to then create rules, but it cannot be clearly founded in uh, a constitution or so. So it's a much more vague nation. There are some people that are very fond of the idea of global governance, other who are very critical of it. So those who think it's a very good idea, they say, well, we live in a globalized world and we don't want to go back to a world of national states. So we need some kind of process to govern this world that we live in and that we want to live in, but we don't have and maybe don't want to and we are nowhere near having a global government. So we have to find other ways and this operation of negotiation on many levels involving many actors 
that's the best thing we can do right here. The critics, however, say that this is a little bit arbitrary, that it's a loss of democratic accountability because democratic accountability is only there for national governments bound to sovereignty, bound to their constitutions, and this global governance process means giving up democracy. So there are some who are very positive about it, some who are very negative about it, but it's definitely a concept that what one should think of. Now the question is who does this global governance? And I'm not gonna speak all of the speak about all of the actors that I just named, so I'm not gonna speak much about transnational corporations right now. I'm only gonna name some of the most important international organizations that mostly emerged in those 75 years that we talk about today. First, we have to look at international organizations that have a goal that we could call political. Here we have to address two institutions. The first found its end at the beginning of the period that we're looking at today, and this is the League of Nations. It was founded after World War I with the goal to maintain world peace and by the mere fact that we're referring to the World War as World War I today, we can see that it didn't work out. One of the main factors for it not to work out was that the United States didn't put all its weight behind it after the initial years at least. And that we also had the Great Depression and we had this great international financial instability of the late 20s and the 1930s. This in the end meant that the League of Nations did not work and the, this of course escalated into World War II. After World War II, many nations thought uh, still that not the idea of the League of Nations was bad, but that it was badly implemented. So they started a second attempt now with the United Nations. And the United Nations had a far bigger um, scope and far more members and it of course survived until today and it's very hard to give a general track record but at least one can say we didn't have a world war three or something that uh, would generally be referred to as such these days so one might argue that the united nations did a better job at maintaining world peace but it's of course by no means sure that this was because of the united nations however this is its objective the next group of international organizations that I will discuss here are of particular importance to our class because they refer to economic questions. So these organizations are about the global economic governance. The first organization that I discuss is certainly not the most powerful of these. However, it is the oldest of these. So it was founded first. It was founded in 1919 and it's called the International Labour Organization. What's very particular about this organization is that in its main governing bodies it does not only have representatives of the member states, it also has representatives of the trade unions and business organizations from the member states. For example, Belgium is a member of the ILO and Belgium does not only uh, send representatives of the government there, so in the main decision-making bodies of the ILO we have two representatives from the Belgian government, one more representative from Belgian trade unions and one more representative from um, Belgian uh, business organizations. So this is very particular about them. The main goal of the ILO is fostering social justice and this of course is a very vague notion. More concretely one of the specific goals of the ILO is to foster decent work which mostly means decent work conditions as globally as possible. So not only to make sure that workers have sufficient wages to live, but also to make sure that their working conditions are well, so that there is a limitation on their working hours, that there is um, um, a certain standard of workplace safety and so on and so on. If you compare this to other goals of the labor movements, these might be uh, seeming very humble. However, if you look at the actual situation for workers in many sectors all over the world, it is quite an ambitious goal. And possibly you think of 
workers in the industry in China or in the textile industry in Bangladesh right now, but you don't have to look that far away. Even if you look at agricultural workers, for example, in Southern Europe that um, harvest um, maybe tomatoes or in Germany that harvest asparagus or strawberries, they also work under quite bad um, conditions. And possibly you heard in the news, at least if you listen to German news, you probably heard something about the situation in German slaughterhouses in the last couple of days because there were corona outbreaks in some of these slaughterhouses. However, even without corona, the work conditions in the German meat industry are horrible and they are also horrible by international comparison. So there is a lot to be done right there. And in what the ILO does is try to define standards and then also um, see whether certain countries live up to these standards that they agreed to in their negotiations. The next institution is the GATT or uh, the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, which um, was founded in 1947 and does not really exist anymore because it became part of the WTO, but formally it still does exist. The main goal of this agreement was to foster international trade by removing tariffs and other barriers to um, international trade. And it was founded as a general agreement because back then the they governments were not able to agree on an international trade organization. So the next best thing they could come up with was the general agreement and it was quite successful in helping national governments to engage in negotiations for removing um, trade barriers. However, almost 40 years later, in 1994, the governments finally did agree to create um, an international organization with the same task, which is the World Trade Organization, which has exactly the same tasks and which um, absorbed the old gut, but now as an international organization, which um, far bigger capacities to actually do this. The next two institutions are um, the institutions that came into place with um, the Bretton Woods Agreement. These are the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The World Bank was founded in 1944 and has the main goal of reducing poverty and fostering development. And what the World Bank does is it gives credit for investment, particularly in um, the industries, so that countries that um, are maybe behind in um, uh, industrial development have a chance to catch up. And the, this was first aimed at um, European countries, which were devastated by the war. But today, of course, the World Bank is not very much engaged um, in European countries, but rather in the so-called um, developing world of the Global South. The International Monetary Fund is sometimes called the sister organization of the World Bank. It does not have the main goal of um, fighting poverty or fostering development, also these are among its goals. Its main goal is to stabilize the international monetary system and its main tool is also um, giving credits but not for investment but rather for states that have problems um, in um, paying their debts or um, in um, paying in general or that are not liquid at the moment. Then the IMF steps in as some kind of lender of last resort for states. And what also both of these institutions do is um, advise states on what their policies um, should be. And in general, both of these institutions together, together with the WTO had a somewhat questionable reputation uh, in the 1990s and in the um, first years of the uh, 21st century as being actors that push for um, liberalization and free trade without um, looking at the actual consequences. However, this changed to some degree um, in the last couple of years. So, for example, when it comes to the Eurozone crisis um, 10 years ago, the IMF was one of the institutions that 
pushed um, for less austerity in Greece, for example. The next two institutions are way less formal than the ones that I mentioned before. The first is what is today the G7. It used to be G5, G6, G7, G8, and now again G7. It's a group of the most important um, industrial countries in the world. And these countries come together on a semi-annual basis to just discuss and to some degree coordinate their economic strategies and their macroeconomic um, policies. It started out mainly as um, European countries plus the United States and Japan and then at some point uh, it included, um, it still includes Canada, at some point it also included Russia. Russia became part of it in the late 1990s but in 2014 after the invasion of Crimea Russia was uh, once again excluded from um, this um, discussion round. And then in the late 1990s another group with a similar purpose was created which is the G20. The idea of the G20 is quite similar only that it does not only include the early industrialized countries of Europe, North America and Japan. It also includes some of the so-called newly industrialized countries, most importantly perhaps um, Brazil, India and China. And it's also a discussion round that meets regularly to discuss the global economy with a more diverse setting or with more diverse perspectives. Then we also have international organizations um, that have more military focus. The most important we have the NATO or North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, which is mainly about um, common defense uh, of the actors, or if you want to say it less euphemistically, you could say it's not only about defense, but also about um, widening the power base and the sphere of influence. And its counterpart during the Cold War years was the Warsaw Treaty. However, this is defunct by now, of course. Finally, in addition to all these organizations that I mentioned so far, which have um, a global scope, we also have regional organizations most importantly probably the European Union because it's not only a free trade agreement but it also is a political union to much wider degree or much higher degree than all um, these other institutions that are named there. Um, however, these kinds of regional organizations exist um, in many regions, oftentimes mainly as um, free trade agreements. One last thing has to be mentioned here. The headline says international organizations, but if you paid attention to what I said before, you'll see that four of these are not actually um, organizations. So the, the general agreement on trades and tariffs was only an agreement. So it's an institution, not um, an organization. The same is true for the G7 and G20, but in a different sense, because these are not even formal treaties. These are just um, informal meetings. So. Again, the G20 and G7, they don't even have a website that you could write to. And when Russia was disinvited from this club, there was no formal procedure because there's no formal membership. It's just that countries agreed to come together. In another way, the NAFTA, or now it's called USMCA, so the North American Free Trade Agreement, it's also not an organization, but only um, a free trade agreement. All of these institutions engage in global governance in one way or the other. For us, most interesting are, of course, those institutions that engage in the global economic governance. And here you must say that particularly the three big organizations, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund actually have quite a big influence on how the international political economy is structured and is working, of course, they can only um, uh, act in agreement, at least with the most important um, national governments that are out there. So it's very hard for them to do something against the interests of the United States, some European countries and China. However, they do have some agency of their own. And so there is some actual global governance taking place through these um, international organizations. As usual, I'll end today's session by briefly sketching some of the key innovations in different fields that happened in these 75 years.
In politics, we can roughly distinguish two or three phases. The first is what we call the Cold War, so the superpower conflict between the Western bloc led by the United States on the one side and the Soviet bloc led by the Soviet Union on the other side, with much of the rest of the world um, being somewhere between, between spectators and battlefields of this big conflict. So this is what international relations theorists call a bipolar world. After that, so maybe roughly from 1990 to 2010, we had what we would call U.S. global hegemony. So then the, one of the two superpowers faded away. So the United States was the only superpower that's left. And many observers said that now they run this world as a global hegemon or even as a global empire, so we might have a unipolar world. However, in recent years, and it's not so easy to name one year when this changed, there is a lot of talk that we are now shifting into the direction of a more multipolar world. And this has something to do, on the one hand, with the decline of US power, maybe because the US overplayed their cards in the wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan, maybe also related to that because um, uh, under Barack Obama and now under Donald Trump, they engage in policies where they do not um, try to wield this kind of um, global hegemony in this kind of way. On the other hand, it's also that other states are now becoming stronger and stronger, most importantly China, but you could also talk about the other so-called BRICS countries, which is um, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. and they are very differently strong, but however, some of them are becoming more important. So many observers say that now we're looking towards a more multipolar world with possibly the United States being one pole, the European Union another one, then maybe China, India, Russia, Brazil having also the role of regional hegemons. So we have two or three phases that we have to look at when we talk about politics in these 75 years. In general, we can also see what I just described. We have a rise in the importance of international organizations and we have the emergence of something that we might refer to as global governance if we don't think that this term is um, total nonsense. When it comes to trade, what we see in these 75 years is in general an expansion of trade. But remember, international trade was already big in 1900. It then shrunk towards 1945 and then um, it grew once again and it grows faster since 1970s and 1990s and what we have in general is the emergence of a global free trade regime under the GUT and the WTO so tariffs are systematically lowered in these um, international institutions. An important year here is 2001 when China finally became a member of the WTO making this more global of an organization. As important, of course, is um, the early 90s when the former Soviet bloc um, became available to free trade with the West. Um, in general, also, we see um, the emergence of regional free trade treaties all over the world. I just mentioned them. So we have the European Union in Europe, we have Mercosur in much of Latin America, we have um, former NAFTA, now USMCA in North America and uh, ASEAN in Eastern Asia and um, some uh, different regimes in um, African countries. So there is an emergence of many um, regional free trade treaties. When we look at production, at least in the early industrialized countries, we see a transformation from Fordism to post Fordism. So from um, a world where production was focused around um, production lines and factories to an economy where the service sector becomes bigger and where also digitalization plays a bigger role. Viewed at it more globally, we still have a lot of industrial production, but it um, in parts relocated to um, Asian countries. And this happened in part due to um, the possibilities of offshoring. So some Asian countries, particularly China, have these special economic zones which are more open to international investment 
and to international trade and which allows um, the Western companies to um, build production facilities there and to invest there and then invest there to produce for markets outside of China. What we also have this time is the emergence of global production chains. So beforehand in the colonial world, we had mainly international production in the way that raw materials were produced in the colonies, then shipped to the colonial centers, and there they will, were processed to manufacture goods. Now we have these kind of globalized production chains where we can't even tell in which country this car or this notebook was actually made because so many steps for the production are distributed among so many countries that it's very hard to pinpoint this anymore. And this is an innovation of these 75 years. When we look at um, labor, this also um, is mirrored there. So we now have a much more globalized division of labor. We have a tertiarization in the early industrialized society, so an expansion of the service sectors. This, however, was only made possible by relocating much of the industry to Asian countries where now industrial work is performed and mostly under worse um, conditions than it used to be performed um, in uh, the early industrialized countries, which is one of the reasons why this is outsourced or offshored in the first place, because it's cheaper there. What we also have now to a higher degree is um, seasonal migrant labor. Of course, we had um, labor migrants for a very long time, but now it becomes more feasible for workers to cross national borders in order to work somewhere for a shorter time. So as long as a certain building site is open or as long as the harvest season um, takes at a certain place. And what we also have now are global care chains. So care work in the early industrialized countries being performed by particularly women from poorer countries and then maybe their care work is performed by women from even poorer countries in some, in some cases. When we look at finance, we see quite dramatic changes over the course of these 75 years. So in the first years um, of this um, period, we had rather strict capital control measures by states. So they did not allow um, uh, unlimited foreign investment in their countries and even less did they allow capital to be transferred out of their countries um, into other countries um, because they wanted to keep their capital uh, in their country as investment. And we also saw um, fixed exchange rates in the Bretton Woods system. And this change to a global um, economic and financial order in which we have a strongly liberalized um, international investment order. So now it's very easy, um, at least uh, in most countries, to um, uh, export capital, if you will. And also now we have floating exchange rates. So the currencies are not um, packed to the dollar or to the gold standard anymore. In general, we can say that financial markets also became more and more important as um, a share of the, the uh, GDP, but also as um, a location where decisions for the economy are made. Looking at the way businesses are organized, we observe that transnational corporations become more and more important and become dominant actors in the production over this period. And we also see the financial sector gaining importance um, in contrast to the industrial sector. In the military, we also have to distinguish two periods at least. First, we had um, the Cold War, which was shaped by nuclear deterrence. Many scholars argue that the fact that we didn't have an all-out superpower war since the Second World War is not due to successes of the um, United Nations, but rather due to the fact that now we have nuclear weapons and states just don't dare to go into all of war anymore because it would have such bad consequences for them. What we had instead were proxy wars. So the superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States, they didn't engage in wars where they uh, had their own soldiers shooting at one another, rather they had their proxies fight out wars 
in uh, Vietnam and in Afghanistan in particular, but also in many countries in Africa and Latin America. After the Cold War, we have um, US dominance in the military. And in spite of what I said before about um, maybe having a multiple world, when it comes to the military, we clearly do not have that. So militarily, the United States are still overwhelmingly um, dominant. In general relations, these 75 years also saw big changes. The golden age of capitalism, which roughly reached from 1945 to 1975, was marked by the male breadwinner model. In the male breadwinner model, wage labor is primarily performed by men who thereby obtain enough income to pay for their whole family. Women, on the other hand, are supposed to do the care work, the domestic work, um, the reproductive work without receiving any formal payment for it, but financially their men take care for them. This model came under pressure. One of the sources of this pressure were the second and the third wave of feminism that we saw in the course of these 75 years. And then there came some kind of transformation. And part of this transformation is that we today have these international care chains that I just talked about with female care workers, mostly female care workers from poorer countries um, coming to the richer countries, performing the care work there and thereby freeing those women that were in the male breadwinner model supposed to do um, their own care work, but also the care work for their men, of course, um, freeing them for the labor market, making them available to the labor market. So if we see a rise in female employment currently in the United States or in Germany or in other early industrialized countries, this is partly made possible by care workers from other parts of the world coming to these countries. The transition from the embedded liberalism of the after years to present day neoliberalism also had a cultural side. What we see in many social spheres is a general democratization or liberalization which was demanded and also fought for and obtained particularly by some of these new social movements which emerged in the late 60s. One of the products of all these movements and their successes is what is sometimes referred to as progressive neoliberalism, which is a term mainly coined by Nancy Fraser. In progressive neoliberalism, we on the one side have a strong emphasis on inclusivity, diversity and equality, but these um, values and ideas are then coupled as with individualism and with economic liberalism. Fraser and others go on to argue that this progressive neoliberalism is welcomed by some but resented by others who then also um, resist these developments. And they resist the economic side of it as well as the cultural side of it. And this resistance to progressive neoliberalism is then supposedly one of the sources of the successes that the radical right had in recent years in Europe, in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And this is then where we are today because now we are at the end of the historic part of our lecture. That's it for today. I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week when we're gonna discuss international trade. Goodbye.